Now, the part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is there in verse 17, where the Bible reads, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And what I want to preach about this morning is I want to cover the false doctrine of Calvinism. You know, there's a doctrine out there called Calvinism that basically flies in the face of this scripture, because this scripture teaches that whosoever will, may come and take the water of life freely. What does it mean, whosoever will? It means whosoever is willing, whosoever wants to. It's available to all. Greetings and felicitations. I would like to thank you and welcome you to this video. This video is dedicated to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as I have mentioned in my previous video, this video is not going to be about textual criticism. This video is about Calvinism and We'll call him free will because Pastor Stephen Anderson does not think he's an Arminian, though he argues very much like an Arminian. But anyway, um, what we were going to do is we're going to investigate Pastor Stephen Anderson's criticism of Calvinism in his sermon, that part of which I, the beginning of which actually I have just um, shown you. So as we take a look at this, we will look at his segments and we'll look at his critiques and we'll try to show through the King James Bible only that predestination, the doctrines of grace, Calvinism, whatever you like to call it, is supported and taught in the scriptures. And that what Pastor Stephen Anderson, though I believe he is a true Christian and a very zealous man for the Word of God and a very zealous um, uh, advocate for uh, preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel, I think he's off on this matter. And uh, so we want to take a look at this. And I hold no animosity towards Dr. Pastor Anderson. I think he's a, he's a wonderful person. And I think he's very, very zealous for the truth. And hopefully, uh, by presenting the truth of the Word of God, in contrast to how he's, he's teaching these things, that we can see, and hopefully, Lord willing, that he will see, that Calvinism... Uh, though it is called Calvinism, or the doctrines of grace, are the true uh, teachings of the Bible. So let's take a look at what he has said. Um, in this first part, he's talking about the will. And he's saying uh, things like, whosoever will, will come. And the Bible teaches that in several places. And uh, his, his, um, his uh, presentation in, uh, in the book of Revelation is, is perfectly straightforward and good. And I agree with him. Whosoever will, will come. Okay, But we have to take a look at that. What is meant by the will? And here I'm going to put up a, a quotation from Jonathan Edwards on the prevailing notions of the freedom of the will. It's just a simple definition of what will is. And uh, what we see here is that the will is an act of choosing. That uh, a, cho a choice is made. You have to, to choose one thing or another, or you might have even multiple four or five choices or anything of that nature. But in uh, one fashion or another, it is the will making a choice. Now, in biblical uh, terminology, and when we're talking about the gospel, you're either going to choose heaven or hell, and, uh, which is kind of a hard. Uh, if, if somebody sees the horrors of hell, would they ever choose something like that? It's the, you have to ask, you know, the question concerning choice in, the, uh, in that matter. I mean, it's not much of a choice that you're given. Though, of course, you're given the choice. But when we take a look at the will, right, and Calvinists, and I believe the Bible, does not talk about a neutral will. It talks about a free will. Uh, the will is free to choose according to its desires, that it chooses one thing or another. 
the reason why you choose heaven rather than hell is because you love heaven more than you love hell. And this is a matter concerning any choice that we make. We always make the choice where our desires like the most. And let me give you a few examples. Uh, in, the first example is, let's suppose that you really, really love chocolate ice cream, right? And you hated and you absolutely despised, let's say, pistachio, uh, pistachio ice cream, right? Um, if I put before you a bowl of chocolate ice cream and a bowl of pistachio ice cream, which one would you choose? All right, you would choose the one that you desire the most. Now, in this case, it would be the chocolate. <laughs> I had a student once say, well, you know, I would choose the pistachio. So I was like, well, well why, why would you choose the pistachio if you like the chocolate better? And he says, just to prove you wrong. <laughs> so, so um, yes, uh, but the thing is, he didn't prove me wrong. What he did was, he desired to prove me wrong was greater than his desire to eat the chocolate ice cream. So he chose still according to what he desired to do. Um, another example, um, and when you're in a cafeteria, all right, and you've just, you have your food on your, on your tray, and you just paid for it, and you turn around and you're looking for a place to sit. Um, as you are looking for a place to sit, you have a free choice. You can sit wherever you want, right? But you go through a whole laundry list of, um, of reasons why you want to sit somewhere. Um, I don't want to sit over there because it's too sunny. I don't want to sit over there because those people are too noisy. And then you might say, oh, there's a friend of mine. I think I'll go sit with them. The thing is, your prevailing desire was what made you choose to sit next to your friend rather than to sit over by the sun or by over by the noisy people or whatever. So whenever you make a choice, it's always according to your greatest desires. And this is uh, evident even in a robbery. If somebody comes up to you and sticks a gun in your chest and says, your money or your life, you're going to choose to give him whichever one you desire least. If you desire to live, all right, then you'll give him your money. If you, desire, if you think your money is more important, then you'll give him your life. He'll take your money anyway after he kills you. But that's not the point. The point is that even when you are forced to make a choice, that choice that you're given always is is chosen according to the desires in your heart. So the Calvinist believes that you have a free will, that you freely choose uh, whatever it is you chose, but that will is also determined by your desires. What you like is what you'll choose, and that's very simple. I think we all can agree that that is the case. Um, there is no such thing as a neutral will. That is, if we have a donkey, for instance, standing between two bales of hay, and both bales of hay are equally appealing to the donkey. In other words, the donkey has no reason to choose the right one or to choose the one on his left. So uh, what happens is, since he has, he has no really desire to go either way, he stays in the middle and he starves to death. Right? That's the idea of a neutral will. And I believe that's what the Arminians are trying to say, that the will is neutral and that uh, then it either chooses one or the other. But if a will is neutral, then it can't choose because there's no desire for either one or the other. Um, if you are standing there in the cafeteria and you have no desire to sit anywhere, you're not going to sit down. Right? Um, and that's the same thing with the pistachio and the chocolate ice cream. Uh, if you have no desire for either one of them, you won't eat either one of them. So the thing is, the, the will here is uh, determined by our choices, by, by our desires. Our choices are determined by our desires. What we choose to do or what we refuse to do is done according to our greatest or our least desire. If you don't want to do something, you will choose not to do it. If you want to do something, you will choose to do it. So that's, that's, I need to set that forth very clearly uh, and, and uh, very concisely so that you understand that the rest of this conversation that I'm going to have with um, uh, Pastor Anderson on this matter is based on this very fundamental idea of the choice of the will. If you can see that, if you can see that your will is not neutral when it comes to a choice, then the whole idea of Calvinism will open up to you, Lord willing, and uh, you'll see 
that it isn't according to your choices that you are saved. It's according to the grace of God and the love of God and God's love to you first and then you make the choice. But let's take a look at what Dr. Um, Anderson is saying here and we'll take a look at all five points of the Calvinism. Um, the first one is total depravity. So let's see what um, uh, Mr. Anderson has to say concerning the idea of total depravity. So let's start out with the first one, total depravity. Total depravity is the point that they believe that takes the choice out of salvation. It basically eliminates man's free will, that man has no free will. Because what they believe is that total depravity is the condition of the unsaved that they are unable to even turn to God, to even believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, unless God does it for them. I mean, they basically believe that man is just totally depraved because he has no good thing in his flesh. Therefore, he is unable to turn to God and be saved, unable to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, God has to give him the faith to be able to believe on Jesus Christ. That's what Calvinism teaches. Now, the Bible teaches that we have to make the choice or the decision to turn to Jesus Christ by faith, to believe on Him, to come to Him and take the water of life freely. Calvinism removes the free will out of salvation. Okay, now let me show you some scriptures on this. Go back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. See, whosoever will may come. Well, th that doesn't jive with total depravity because they're teaching that whosoever w will is, in is unable to come. Because they teach you're unable to come unless God chooses you and then he makes you come. Okay, well that's not whosoever will may come. Now look what the Bible teaches in John chapter 5, verse 39. Because this total depravity teaches that man has no free will in regard to salvation. God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Let's see if that jives with what the Bible teaches. It says in John 5, 39, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, verse 40, and ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. So right there, the reason why people don't have life is because they will not come to him. And the will there is referring to their will. They don't want to come to him. They are not willing to come to him. He says, you will not come to me that you might have life. Flip over to chapter 6, John chapter 6. Now in John chapter 6, you're going to find a verse that Calvinists will often use to prove their point of total depravity. They'll use this point to say, well, man is unwilling to turn to Christ. He's not willing. I'm sorry, they'll say, Good night. I'm saying he's not willing. They say he's not even able to. He can't. He can't believe on Christ. This is the one that they'll show you in John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So that verse right there is a verse that Calvinists will use to say, hey, see, you can't come to Christ. You cannot come to salvation except the Father draw you. You must be drawn of the Father. Okay, keep that in mind. Flip over to chapter 12. Because in John 6, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. That's a verse that Calvinists love to quote, but here's the part that they didn't get to in the book of John. Chapter 12, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So he says, well, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. Oh, see? Unsaved people cannot be saved unless God chooses them and gives them the grace and the faith to bring. No, it says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Of course, the Calvinist will just tell you that all doesn't really mean all. Well, I wonder if believe doesn't really mean believe. I wonder if cross doesn't really mean cross. I wonder if heaven doesn't really mean heaven or hell doesn't really mean hell. I mean, that's a pretty foolish argument yep. yes. to say all doesn't mean all. But I'm going to prove to you a little later in the sermon that all really does mean all. But he says here that he will draw all men unto him, signifying what death he should die. Another scripture that Calvinists will point to is later on in the chapter in uh, John 12, Verse 39, where it says, Therefore they could not believe, because the desire said before, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. But of course we know, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, we can compare that with Romans 1. This is talking about people that are reprobate. 
This is talking about people that have already been rejected. They've already rejected Christ. And so he's blinded their minds and given them over to a reprobate mind. You know, on your own time, compare that with Romans 1. And it explains that perfectly. But if you would go to Ephesians chapter 8, because the Calvinists will take Ephesians chapter 8, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and they will try to say that, you know, man is unable to turn to Christ for salvation. Man is unable to believe on Christ. God has to give him the faith so that he can even be saved. So God chooses you, then he makes you believe. That's what Calvinism teaches. It's, it's false. Look, people make their own choice whether they're going to be saved or not. They hear the word of God and they choose to either believe it or not believe it. That's what the Bible teaches. But look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, Calvinists are grammatically challenged. And so therefore, they will actually tell you that the gift of God in this verse is faith. Now, that is a complete failure of grammar, both in English and in the original language. It's impossible for the gift of God be referring to faith. It just doesn't work, okay? Now, look at this verse carefully. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, okay? Now, notice the phrase, not of yourselves, okay? It is the gift of God. Now, Calvinists will look at that and say, See, faith is the gift of God. Faith is not of yourselves. But hold on a second. Look at the next verse. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, look, obviously the not of yourselves and the not of works are both parallel statements. And guess what they're both referring to? Salvation. That you're saved. Now, just to prove this further, there are many scriptures that describe salvation as the gift of God. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter number 4. And there is not a scripture that teaches that faith is the gift of God. As much as Calvinists who are grammatically challenged would like to say that Ephesians 2.8 is telling you that faith is the gift of God. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should What is not of works? Salvation's not of works. Now, to say faith is not of works doesn't make any sense. Because we already know faith is not of works. I mean, faith is faith and works is work. He's saying salvation's not of works. Salvation's not of yourselves. Salvation's the gift of God. But if you would look at John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest what? The gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Water. So here, the Bible talks about asking for the gift of God. And what are we asking for? Living water. That's the water of life. That's eternal life. The Bible uses that description all the time. And he's saying, you ask and you receive living water. That is the gift of God. And in Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved... Oh, good night. I'm, I'm just getting everything wrong. Today. <laughs> for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all throughout the Bible, the term gift of God or the gift there, we see it referring to salvation, not to faith, and that also defies grammar to try to make the gift of God refer to faith in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, uh, Calvinists will often say, well, you know, the Bible never mentions free will. I've had Calvinists say that to me. They, somebody said to me recently, you know, show me free will in the Bible. Show me where the Bible says free will. Look at 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Bible is clear that if it were God who decided who would be saved and who would be not saved, if it was according to God's will, then basically his will would be that no one would perish. And that all would come to repentance. So this idea that God only chooses certain people and it's all according to his will is false. It's our will that either causes us to believe on Christ or causes us to reject Christ. That's our own will at work. That's our own free will. Okay, so that's the first point of Calvinism, total depravity. Well, there it is. Uh, Pastor Anderson has presented 
at least how he understands what um, total depravity is. I don't think he's got the whole of it. Um, the idea of total depravity um, centers on the nature of man. What is man's nature before he is saved? Um, is he dead in trespasses and sins, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2? Or um, does man have some kind of goodness still left in him that gives him the impetus, gives him the desire to choose God? Um, with the Calvinist, we believe that man must be born again before he can choose or believe in God. And uh, I think that if we take a look, for instance, at uh, the scriptures, um, the first thing we'd like to look at is what is original sin? Um, is original sin something that stains the whole soul so that man is entirely enslaved to Satan and his choices and all his desires are to do evil continually? Or um, is man partly fallen? Is there some part of him that's still good that gives him that choice to choose God? And thus his will is kind of neutral. There's, he has this sinful nature that's pulling him one way, and he has this good nature that pulls him the other way, and uh, then he can choose. He can make that choice between, uh, am I going to be a sinner or am I going to be a saint? And uh, I think that's the way that um, an Arminian or um, Pastor Anderson, who later on will say he's not an Arminian, but it seems to me like he's, uh, he's following in that kind of direction. Um, but let's take a look at what um, the scriptures say. And uh, because it's more, what's more important is not a philosophy, whether it is Calvinism or whether it is Arminianism, um, but what does the scripture say? What does Jesus say on the subject? Um, I have quoted one passage here. Um, Jesus says that he who sins is a slave of sins, of sin. He's a slave or a servant of Satan. And, uh, and then he goes on, and uh, you can read the full context if you like. Um, I tried to edit it out a little bit because, you know, I didn't have enough room. But essentially his statement is saying that um, these, there are people who are of the devil. There are Jews there who don't like Jesus because why? Because they are enslaved to Satan. And uh, if Jesus would make them free, then they would be free from that. But Jesus is not going to make them free. It's God's choice to make a person free or not free. And uh, because Jesus doesn't make him f them free, then they go on and they commit murder. Um, another passage that you'll find uh, concerning uh, this is um, John 3.19. And uh, let me grab my Bible, and we'll look up John 3.19. And um, there it is. And John 3.19, um, Jesus says, right after he says, you must be born again, and uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned. Okay, but then Jesus says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And what does it say? And men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. In other words, because their heart is evil, because they love darkness, their deeds are evil. And men love the darkness rather than the light. In other words, their choices are to be that they love the darkness because their deeds are evil. They will do evil deeds because they love the darkness. And the evil deeds are indicative of a bad heart. And uh, they love the darkness because their deeds were evil. And when they commit sin, when they do sin, it makes them all the more a slave or a servant to Satan or a servant to sin. Um, so Jesus here is telling us that um, men loved darkness rather than the light and therefore, what will their choices be? If they love something, they will choose it. They will choose to sin, they will choose to do evil, and they will choose to do it evil continually. Um, but let's take a look in, uh, at the beginning of the Bible. Um, in Genesis 6-5, we have, for example, um, a statement uh, from God concerning Noah. And uh, this is after the fall, obviously. And uh, God is talking about the nature of man in general. And he's saying, And God saw that wickedness of men, man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, every imagination, again, 
every meaning every if we're going to take the literalist position that Stephen, uh, uh, Mr. Anderson wants to talk about, the every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I think that we have to stress that, that every imagination of man's heart it was only evil continually, is what the Bible says here in uh, Genesis 6, verse 5. And so if the imagination of man's heart was only evil, if his heart is imagining evil, he's going to choose evil. He can't choose good if he's, his heart is evil. Uh, it just doesn't work. Now later on um, in this passage, it's going to say, but Noah found grace in the sight of God. Okay, so in other words, um, some people will interpret that to mean, well, you know, Noah had some goodness in him uh, that God saw, and therefore God chose him. But it's grace that Noah found. It wasn't a work that Noah found. And so it wasn't anything that Noah did that caused God to be gracious to him. It was unmerited favor that God showed to him. And uh, we see that again in um, <clears throat> uh, Genesis 8.21. Uh, here, uh, this is after the flood, uh, Noah has let the animals out of the ark, and he and his sons and his sons' wives and his wife are there, are the only ones on the planet at this time. And at verse 21, it says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more and everything living as I have done. And again, the imagination of every man's heart, or a man's heart, is evil from his youth. And that's God's general statement of the nature of man in, a, in an unsaved state. Now, of course, Noah and them were saved, but even still they had this, this sin nature in them. And God sees this, and he's, he knows the nature and the heart of man, is that it's evil from its youth. So that's, uh, those are those uh, verses. Uh, let's turn now to Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, 5. And uh, Psalm 51 says, 51, 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Okay, now I think this is an important verse when it comes to um, abortion. All right, you can't impute sin to a non-person. Okay, and if you're a, if you're a sinner according to God's uh, word here, from your from being from the very conception, that is, this is original sin. That man is considered by God to be a sinner from conception. I mean, he didn't have to do anything good or evil from conception. All right, God says man is a sinner. And uh, if you are a sinner, Jesus says, if you sin, you are a slave to sin. We are all born slaves to sin, slaves to Satan, slaves to ourselves. We are enslaved in that way. And therefore, all of our choices will be what? It will be to sin. It will not be too good. It will be, we will choose that which we desire the most. And because of that, we have a heart of sin, we have desires for sin, we have desires for our own self-aggrandizement. A um, friend of mine says narcissism, and that's very, very true. Um, we are all narcissistic in one fashion or another. It's a matter of sin. And uh, because it's sin, all right, and the sin nature in us, therefore, we choose to do evil. And we can't not choose to do good. I mean, we can do human good, but we can't be, and even though our good, even our good works, I mean, Isaiah says, are filthy rags in God's sight. So there's nothing that we can do, whether it is by our will, or whether it is by our doing, or by whether we are a Jew or a Gentile, by the flesh, or by, you know, generation, natural generation, however you want to call it, there's nothing that we do or are that can recommend us to God. It is God's sovereign choice to save us or not save us. We are, later on, we'll look at a brand picked out of the fire. Um, let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. 
um, what does Jeremiah 13 23 say can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil again this is picking up on what Jesus is saying if you commit sin you are a slave to sin and if you are an, an Ethiopian can't change his skin nor can a leopard change his spots so then can you who are accustomed to do evil do good can you do good who are accustomed to do evil um, that's how the King James Version puts it and it's a very well put out verse in other words if you have this sinful nature in you all right there's no way that you can change it yourself just like the Ethiopian can't change his skin or the leopard changing his spots so you who are accustomed to do evil cannot do good you cannot choose God you cannot make him uh, you cannot do anything that will uh, recommend him to you God has to choose you first he is the one who is gracious to us if by some act of our will or if it's something some faith that is within us that is apart from God if it is not something that God has given us then uh, we have so much to both boast and uh, I'll ask a question of, of uh, Pastor Anderson a little later on. But I want to go through these verses first. So it's um, Jeremiah 13. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 17.9. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that is Jeremiah's testimony. That all, even our own hearts are deceitful. Our hearts will deceive us. They'll say, well, you're a good person, uh, therefore you're going to heaven. Um, you've done nothing wrong. And the heart will always say to, to a person, it's not you that's wrong. It's this other person. This other person made me do it. <laughs> if you want, the devil made me do it. But, um, you know, if a person gets mad, oh, it's something that this person said. Um, if you get angry and upset and... You, you, you know, it had to be this other person who did it to me that caused me to be angry or upset or, or whatever, um, doing something evil. Uh, he enticed me. I mean, it's like, it's like Eve who was saying to God, you know, the devil tempted me or the devil deceived me and I ate. All right. It's his fault. It's the devil's fault, you know. And then, of course, Adam saying to God, you know, the woman whom you gave me. So our hearts are deceitful. It's always been that way, that and it always wants to convince us that there's something good in us. And that's the, uh, that's the power of a guy like Joel Olstein or, um, or any of these, uh, you, know, you know, prosperity teachers. Right? You're a good person, and it's, you, it's not you that's wrong. It's this other person. It's these other outside situations, whatever. So, but the heart, he's also saying that the heart is desperately wicked. Um, he's not just saying it's wicked. He says it's desperate. It is desperate to do wickedness. It wants to do wickedness. It, it desires wickedness. It's desperate. It, you know, it's a person who is desperate is one who will do anything to get whatever it is is on his is in front of him, and in front of the heart of man is wickedness, and it's desperately seeking to do wickedness. This is the nature of man before he is saved. Right? It takes an act of God. You need to be born again in order to see heaven, in order to get into heaven. And that born again experience is not something that you do. And we're going to look at that in a, in a little bit, uh, what, uh, what it means to be born again. So that's Jeremiah. Let's, uh, let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Uh, da, 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 da. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 9. <clears throat> and uh, here Paul writes, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before, we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Okay? The Jews aren't especially allotted a, a recompense from original sin. Jews and Gentiles are all under the declaration that we are sinners. And Paul said he proved that in the past. Um, as it is written, verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none that understands. There is none that seeketh after God. Okay? And again, I'm going to ask Pastor Anderson, what does the word none mean? What does the word all mean? Does the word all mean all? Does the word none mean none? Right? Um, if it's saying that there are none who are righteous, there are none who seek after God, okay? There is none who do these things, right? It takes a work of the Spirit of God in the heart to change the heart and to make the heart new. Um, and we'll look at that again in, in a little further. So let's go. Um, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. All right? These are absolute statements. They say Paul is not making qualification here. Now, you can make qualifications when it comes to absolute statements. I can say, for example, all Americans are free. I could say that. And because the word all is qualified by the word Americans, therefore I'm not talking about Russians or uh, British people or people in South America or whoever. I'm just talking about Americans. All Americans are free. right? And if I'm living in America, maybe I could say all are free. I could think that, but maybe I'm, I'm not right about that. But, um, so, but uh, I, it can be qualified. But this is not qualification. There is no qualification in the word none. It means there is none righteous, no, not one. Paul is very emphatic about this. So that's Romans uh, uh, 3, 9 through 12. If we take a look at verse 22 now, skip down there. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 20, 23. So, <laughs> it's only those who believe who are the ones who are saved. And again, here's a qualification. Not everybody believes. All who believe in the name of Jesus shall be saved. But not all people believe in Jesus. Now, if faith is something that is outside of the grace of God, as I think Pastor um, Anderson seems to be saying, and it's something that is inherent in man, then how can Paul say earlier that there is none righteous, no, not one, that there is none that seeketh after God, um, and that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Therefore, it takes a work of the Spirit of God to change the heart, so that the heart is made uh, faithful. It's given faith and repentance. It's made a heart of flesh is a heart of stone. And we'll take a look at that again in the future. Um, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 2.14, talking about the uh, nature of man. Um, 2.14. But the natural man, that is, the man who is not saved, the man who comes who has no faith in God and has, is a sinner and has, is in the state of sin of man. Natural man receiveth not the things of God. So when Jesus is saying to the Jews, okay, you don't believe me because you are not of my Father, uh, he's saying that because they are natural men, they have not received the things of the Spirit of God. Because they're natural thing, men, they cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. For what? They, that is the things of the Spirit of God, are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. That is, the, the natural man cannot know the things of the Spirit of God because they, that is the things of the spiritual of God, are spiritually discerned. That is, the unbeliever or the natural man cannot at all understand the things of God because they are in a state of sin and death. It take, God needs to pull them out of that state of sin and death in order, to, um, in order for them to be saved. Um, another passage, Ephesians chapter 2. Corinthians, we'll go to Ephesians. Philippians, Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 1. Uh, 
And you, that is, he's talking to believers, you who are the believers in Ephesus, hath he quickened. Now, hath he quickened in the King James Version is in um, italics because the words are not in the Greek text. But they are, it is, we'll see it later on, that um, it is a definitely a very godly understanding of what Paul is saying here. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? You're not simply sick. You are dead. When you are not a, a believer in Jesus Christ, God considers you spiritually dead, unable. And, and a dead person cannot sit there and say, I choose God. He cannot sit there and say, save me, God. He's dead. He needs to be quickened by the working of the Spirit of God. And that is what Paul is talking about here. You were dead, therefore you cannot choose God. A dead person can't choose. He's dead. Okay, he needs to be quickened. He needs to be made alive. And that's what Paul is saying here. And it will continue. Verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. All those who are not of the Spirit of God are children of disobedience. And God needs to quicken you to make you a child of a living God. He can't, you, it's not, you are not automatically a child of a living God because God here says that you were dead. Verse 3, among whom also we all, all right, here we go again, Dr. Um, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, all, all means all according to you, and therefore I'm going to use the word all in its sense. Every single person. All had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So God here, before a person is changed and regenerated, considers us dead in trespasses and sins, children of disobedience, and uh, children of wrath, even as all the others. We are all right, in the same boat. We are all headed towards hell. And it's only by the mere grace and mercy of God that a person is pulled out, that you are saved. You were saved not because you chose God, but because God chose you. You were headed towards hell. That's where you wanted to go. That's where you were going. When God changed your heart, when he made you born again, you no longer wanted to, to go to hell. You wanted to go to heaven. You wanted to follow God. And that's what all these passages that Pastor Anderson is talking about. Whosoever wills can come. That's true. But no man is willing to come. That we are all desirous to, to uh, do sin. We are desperately wicked, as Jeremiah says. We are conceived in sin. And in sin did our mother conceive us. We are all headed towards hell. And it is only by the grace and mercy of God that we are pulled out, that we are saved. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, and four, here we have it. Here we have the true gospel being preached to us. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, there it is, that's what he was talking about in verse 1 where the italics was, has quickened us, he has made us alive, all right, <clears throat> together with Christ. And then here we go, by grace we are saved. Right? That's the, God doc the doctrines of grace. You are saved by grace, and grace is unmerited favor. It's not anything that you have done. It's God pouring his grace into your heart. And once that grace is in there, grace gives you the faith to believe. He gives you the repentance to follow after Jesus. But this comes after the working of grace in your heart. And so when Pastor Anderson is talking by grace, you are saved through faith, it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'll get to that in just a few minutes. I want to finish this up here, but I, you know, I was just thought of that. So, um, it is by grace that we are saved, and the word it doesn't refer to faith, it refers to grace. And 
the faith is not something that qualifies the grace. The faith comes with the grace. The grace enters into the stony heart of man. It enters into the sinful heart, this heart that does not want to believe and creates faith. And by changing the desires, the man willfully chooses to follow after Christ. Whereas when the heart is stony and dead and, and does not want to choose God, all it chooses is evil. It is desperately wicked. It only chooses that which is evil. Therefore, God needs to change the heart. And when God changes the heart, the desires and the will follow the heart. So whosoever will, will come. But they only come because their hearts were changed by God. So you see, whosoever will not do the things of God will go to hell. And that's the whole state of mankind. It's only those whom God has pulled out of that state of sin and death that uh, will choose to follow after God. So that's um, Ephesians 2. And finally, um, we'll take a look at one more verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And here we have the capstone. Um, I, think, I don't think how you can talk your way around this one. But here it is. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God which worketh in you what? Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right? Now, I am a Calvinist and I understand grammar. And um, it is God who's working in you what? Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, the word his has to refer to God. I mean, that's how grammar works. Maybe being a Calvinist, I don't have the right grammar, but uh, to me, the word his here means God. And uh, I don't think you can twist it around to say that it's man. But uh, whose good pleasure is it? God is the one who chooses who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. And uh, he, he does it, uh, and he, what he does is he causes a person's will to, become, to choose him, to believe in him. So it's God's work in you both to will and to do of God's good pleasure. Right? So whether a person is saved or whether a person is damned, this is called double predestination, double uh, predestination. Um, God chooses those who will be saved and out of the whole mass of mankind. By making that choice, he is... Uh, not allowing the others to uh, be saved. And again, that goes into the idea of double predestination. He passes over those who will be damned. He does not desire to give them faith and repentance, and therefore they will not be saved. But he chooses, he desires to give faith and repentance, changing the heart so that the person will choose. Whosoever will may come. All right. So that's, um, that's the state of man, and uh, man cannot choose because he is in a state of sin and death. Um, now, uh, he, Pastor uh, goes over several verses that he talks about, um, uh, John 5, 4, John 6, 44, John 12, 32. Um, they will, and John, John 5, uh, 4. Um, Jesus says, they will not come to me. And um, the question is, why will they not come? In uh, John 5, verse 4. Let's look this up to make sure we have it uh, correct. Is it John 5, 4? No, I guess not. Uh, well, he talks about John 6, 44. So we'll take a look at John 6, 44. Um, Jesus says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Um, that's true. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Right? In other words, an act of the Father needs to be done 
to a person to draw um, draw him uh, draw him to Jesus. Now um, again, uh, it appears to me that there's a bit of uh, slipperiness here um, when he quotes from John 12 verse 32. And, uh, and uh, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus tells uh, his disciples, um, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Um, now, I think there is a difference here between the Father drawing people to Jesus and Jesus drawing all men to him. Um, it seems to be that there, he's talking about two different things, the Father drawing, and I think here, when he's talking about the Father drawing, he's talking about those who are in the hand of the Father. All those who will be saved are in the Father's hands, and no one uh, can take them out of the Father's hands, he says. And uh, they're in the Father's hands, they're in my hands. And uh, so if it's the Father who draws them, uh, then it is the Father who is the one who has chosen those who will be saved. Jesus says, I will draw all men to uh, myself. And he may be referring to the free offering. Um, one of the big problems with using this word all, all men, to myself, is uh, what do you do with the people who are living in Jesus' time in China? Uh, is Jesus drawing them to himself? Uh, those who were living in America at the time, or South America, or Africa, or anywhere outside of Jerusalem, all right, in Rome, or anywhere. Is he drawing all men to himself? I mean, you really have to explain what you mean by what you think Jesus is saying here. If he's drawing all men to himself, all right, there are people who have never heard the name Jesus. You know, even before Jesus was, uh, was born, there were people who lived and died and never heard the gospel outside of Israel and stuff like that. So uh, what does he mean by all? Does he mean every single human being who has ever lived? I mean, is that how you're interpreting the word? Then, uh, then uh, you know, I mean, what does that say about he didn't draw all men to him? All men were not standing around the cross at that time. Um, so the word all can be qualified. He doesn't mean all. He means, in this sense, I believe he means all the elect. And, uh, you know, you might not think that that's correct. But let's take a look at another passage. If we look at John 12, verse 19. Uh, John 12, 19. Yeah. Um, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. They say the world has gone after him. Does that mean that every single person in the world is following Jesus at that very moment? Are we going to take the Pharisees' words so literally that we are going to say the world means the world, and therefore the whole world, and therefore every single person is following Jesus? As Jesus is walking away from them, we see the whole world following him. Everybody from China to America to living in uh, Hawaii or Australia, all of them are following Jesus. I mean, if we take the literal understanding of the word world and we apply it here, right, then uh, we have to say that the whole world is following him. However, if we understand that the word world can mean figurative, can mean a figure, in other hard words, the whole world of the Jews, the, all the people who are in that area at that time, I mean, they see, you know, the Pharisees are standing there and their disciples and everyone is following Jesus and they say the whole world is following him. You know, I mean, here's an example of using the, a word um, in a figurative uh, meaning rather than in a literal meaning that the whole world is following him. Uh, so that's John 12, 19. Look it up yourself. Maybe I'm wrong and um, um, we'll take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so now we go to the heart of flesh and the heart of stone. Um, the idea of the heart of stone is only found in a couple of passages in the Bible. Um, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 9. They're both in Ezekiel, actually. Verse 19, 
um, Ezekiel says, and I g will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And uh, the last sentence is the words of the covenant. They shall be my people, I will be their God. God choosing a specific people for himself. And this is done by him taking the stony heart out. When you are born again, that stony heart is pulled out of you. And God gives you a heart of flesh, a heart full of faith and love and joy and peace. And it's, it's, it's a working of the Spirit of God in your heart. And uh, that's what this whole thing is about. That's what, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to take the stony heart out and to give you a heart of flesh. And if God does not do that, you still have that stony heart and you are going to eternal death and hell. God needs to change your heart in order for you to be saved. In order for you to choose to follow after God, you need that stony heart taken out. Because that stony heart will only choose will be desperately wicked. It will only choose evil continually. And, and um, I'll refer you to Philippians chapter 2 again, because that is the, 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 the crux of it. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, Ezekiel 11.19. It also says it in Ezekiel 36.26. So let's turn to 36.26. And uh, it says, and uh, we'll just look at verse 25. And then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? Okay, so God sprinkling the water on a person cleanses the whole person. Um, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart flesh. Um, I don't think you can find any more clearer statements. It's not you pulling the stony heart out, giving yourself faith, or giving yourself the ability to choose God. It's God pulling the stony heart out, giving you a heart of flesh, and then you have the faith, the repentance, the willingness to follow. Um, so it, that's the stony heart. And um, So here we go. We're going to the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. Um, Pastor Stephen, um, I don't think he's really looking at this passage correctly. Um, the word it refers to grace, the grace of God. And uh, it's not talking about, well, the grace gives you salvation. So ultimately, the whole passage is talking about salvation. For you are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Um, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if faith is something that you choose, if you have to add, make an act of your will in order to uh, receive this grace, then it is an act of your will, it is a work. Right? When you ever choose something, you're working. It's not like working like digging a ditch or something like that. But it's, it's work anyway. It's something that you do. It's something that your will actually does. It's a work. So the question I have for you, Pastor, I mean, let's assume that you were sitting in front in a, uh, in a in, or somebody with two people were sitting in an evangel evangelical meeting, and the man is preaching the, the word of God, and one man believes and the other man does not believe. Now, does the man who believes... Is it because he's better than the other man? Is he more intelligent? Is there something in himself, uh, apart from God, that gives him the faith to believe the Word of God? Um, no. No. Not at all. Um, for it is by faith that you are, uh, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Where does faith come from? Faith is a gift of the Spirit of God. As I have said before, it is taking the stony heart out and putting the heart of faith, of flesh, into the heart. Now, why don't, why isn't it? Shall I talk about the fruits of the Spirit? Um, 
love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, number seven, um, etc. Um, those are the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of, faith, uh, of the flesh. It's not a fruit that is within me apart from God. It is a fruit that the Spirit gives me. Um, let's take a look again at Romans 4, verse 9, and see where faith comes from. Romans 4, 9, Acts. I'm going to go into Romans a lot today. Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 4, verse 9. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Verse 9, that was verse 8, verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So in other words, it wasn't because Abraham was circumcised that he received the faith. It wasn't anything that Abraham did. Okay, This faith came to him, all right? It was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. That's Romans 4.9. Let's go to Romans 10.17. Where does this faith come from, is what we're asking. And here it is. <clears throat> so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went out, went into all the earth, and their words into the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? For Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God is, uh, what, uh, is what Paul is saying here. And, uh, but I say, have they not heard? Okay, and who are the they? You have to ask. It's obviously Paul, uh, Paul is talking about the Jews. Yes, verily, the sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Okay. So, um, again, the word earth and world used figuratively here. Uh, Romans 10, 17, Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And again, here God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And, um, and the context is clear in that God, he's talking about the elect because he's talking about the body here. For as we have many members right, in one body, and all members have not the same office. So the qualification here is the church, the elect, those who are the called out ones. <clears throat> okay, Romans 12, 3, 1 Corinthians 2, 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 5. that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So your faith doesn't stand in the wisdom of men, and that would include your own wisdom. It just doesn't include, you know, philosophies and Aristotle or Plato. It includes your own wisdom. Your faith does not stand in that. It stands in the power of God. And uh, 
Galatians 3 verse 2 also shed some light on this pan on this uh, Galatians 3 verse 2 uh, start with verse 1 O foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whom whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you this only would I learn of you received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith are you so foolish having begun in the spirit right are you now made perfect in the flesh have you suffered so many things in vain if it be yet in vain he therefore that minister minister ministereth to you in the spirit and worketh miracles among you doeth he it by the works of a law or by the hearing of faith right i mean paul couldn't be more clearer that where faith comes from it comes from the working of the spirit of god it is a fruit of the spirit it is a it is you being born again you being given that new heart in you in your life so that you can become regenerate and um, that's Galatians 3, 2. And then we can go to Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If this is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith is the number seven, the perfecting of it. Um, so... Uh, if it is the fruit of the Spirit, then it can't be the fruit of the flesh. It can't be something that is in you. It is something that God gives you. And when God gives you the faith to believe in Jesus Christ, that's when you're saved. That's when you're born again. That's when you're made a new man. And it's not a work of man. It is a sovereign work of God. Now, Pastor, Pastor Anderson may say, well, where is the word sovereign? Uh, it's found in the Bible. It's found all over. Translation of the word sovereign means Lord. A sovereign and the word Lord are syn synonymous with each other. Right? But I wouldn't even try to prove to you that God is sovereign. I mean, when you pray, you are praying like a Calvinist. You are asking God for things. You know that God is the one who is the bestower of life and salvation. And you go to him and you ask him for these things. But you don't go. But you can't. If you don't go to him in faith, God will not listen to you. The prayer without faith is is not uh, is not something that the Lord hears. You need to be praying in faith. So God needs to work in your heart to give you the faith that is saving and that clings to Jesus for your salvation, and that makes you cry out, "Abba, Father." It's not that you in anything that you are prior to that. So that's the faith that it is that, um, that, that God is talking about. And it is the gift of God. It is not a thing of man. And um, again, the question I would have to ask, is faith something that man has apart from God? Because that's what you seem to be saying. And if so, can you prove it if it doesn't come by the hearing of the Word of God? Um, and then again, why does one believe and another person does not believe. Is it because you are better than that other person and therefore you can boast about your faith over that one person? God says no. If you are saved by grace, then that faith comes to you by grace. It is only by the mercy of God that you are saved. Um, so salvation is the gift of God and Pastor Anderson is absolutely true. But everything that accompanies salvation is a gift of God, and that includes faith. That includes your willingness to come to Jesus. God has to change your heart, and by changing your desires, your will follows your desires. So finally, um, he, gets, he, he then goes into a little litany about how the Bible talks about free will. Yes, the Bible talks about free will, but you can never find a verse in the Bible that mentions free will specifically in regards to salvation. Right? Uh, Pastor Anderson says he has 17 verses. All of them refer to a free will offering. A free will offering is something that is given by a believer. 
one who has faith in Jesus Christ wants to do a little bit more and, you know, give a free will offering, uh, it is not at all um, acceptable for salvation. Are you saying, Pastor, that giving a free will offering is what's going to save you? None of the passages that you can cite that specifically use the word free will, those 17 passages that you are talking about, does not mention at all, all right, that you are saved because of your free will offering. Uh, you can't find it. It's not there, all right. But I, so I skipped over that part where you were mentioning that free will, and I apologize, but I'm, I'm just trying to be, uh, trying to make this as short as possible, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, so anyway, what you do is you go to uh, 2 Peter 3.9. And uh, unlike a lot of other people who do not quote the whole passage, you do quote the whole passage. And I am thankful and happy that you do so. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. And uh, I'll post it and show it to you here. Um, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, to us. That is, God is long-suffering toward us. Now, I understand the word us to mean believers. I mean, Peter is writing to believers here. This whole letter is written to believers. It's not written to unbelievers. God is long-suffering toward us. Why? He is not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here we have a perfect understanding of the qualification of the word all. All of us, Peter is saying here. That is perfectly grammatical. Um, the thing is, I think you're being ungrammatical by not understanding that the long-suffering is towards us. That why is God long-suffering towards us? Because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And willing that any of us should perish, that is the elect. God is long-suffering towards the elect. He's not long-suffering towards the non-elect. Um, even the Amorites, who were given 400 years, they only had 400 years, they didn't have eternity. God was long-suffering towards us. He's long-suffering towards us to eternity. Our sins are forgiven, all of them, and there's nothing that we can do that will separate us from God. Neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor even yourself can separate you from God. And Pastor Anderson believes that because he believes in perseverance, or what he says, once saved, always saved. But um, here, uh, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And uh, here... Um, Pastor Anderson gives us a perfect um, view of what, how Arminians understand this passage. And Pastor uh, Anderson does not believe he's an Arminian, so I won't, I won't go there with him. But um, if um, God is not willing that any should perish, if this, is, if this is unqualified all, in other words, the whole world, everyone who has ever lived, from Adam and Eve, all the way up through the second coming of Christ. All of them, God is willing to save. All right? If that is God's will, then, um, then what happens when people perish, when they go to hell? We know that there are people who are going to hell. Um, Judas, for example, is a good example. Um, there is no hope for him. Um, he, is, he, he has done evil and is in hell. I mean... Herod, um, Pontius Pilate, there are thousands, millions of people who are going to hell, who are going to perish. But if God is not willing that any of them should perish, then what are you saying? Are you saying that the creature is greater than the Creator? In other words, the will of the Creator is that you would be saved. Therefore, if the creature willingly does not want to be saved, then the creature's will can overcome the Creator's. If God's will is that all people will be saved, they will all be saved, without qualification, without necessity. God just has to say it. All people will be saved. However, if God is only willing to save the elect, 
then that is what he's talking about here. God is long-suffering toward us, right? not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God's long-suffering is to the whole world, then God's long-suffering will, will save them all. Right? It's, it, it, what you have done is you've caused God to be less than man. And that, unfortunately, is the nature of Arminianism is that it is man-centered, it is man's choice that can overcome God's choice. If God has chosen you to salvation, and you can choose not to be saved, then you are saying that you can thwart the will of God. And uh, that, the Bible says, is not at all possible. Um, what I am thinking about right now is Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statement to Daniel. Um, And uh, what? And uh, where is that? Nebuchadnezzar. Here it is, uh, chapter four, verse thirty-four. Um, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does or doeth according to his will, and he doeth according to his will right, in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou at the same time my reason returned unto me and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and brightness returned unto me okay well that's uh, and then that continues but here we have an unbeliever Nebuchadnezzar proclaiming that no one can resist the will of God, that God does according to his will. If God is willing that all men should be saved, then all men will be saved. There's no question about that. God's will comes first. But if God's will is that only the elect will be saved, if God has predestinated those who will go to heaven and those who will go to hell, then that is what's going to happen, and that is what we read in the Bible. All those whom God has chosen will be regenerated. They will, they will receive the new birth, regenerate, birth, uh, new birth, uh, born again, actually. And when you are born again, you will then have faith. You will have the heart of flesh. And having the faith, you will choose to follow God. It all follows. It's a golden chain. God chooses... God saves you, you are regenerated by the Spirit of God, you then believe, you then repent, you then choose, and you, you follow after God. You are a brand as you are pulled from the fire. God is not slack concerning his promise as men count slackness, and is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to salvation repentance. Um, here again, um, Daniel chapter 5, verse 34 and 35. Um, and all the inhabitants are on, of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he, God, doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand or say unto him, What dost thou? No one can stay his hand. If the Arminian is right, in, in, in Peter 2, 9 uh, verse, then people can stay his hand. If God is willing that all should be saved, all unqualified all, every single human being on the face of the earth, if God is willing, then they will all be saved. If God is willing that only the elect will be saved, and that is what we read throughout the Bible, there will be some who are saved and some who are not. 
And those whom God has chosen are the ones who will be saved. And those who he passes over, not desiring to give mercy to them, they will, by their own sins, condemn themselves and go to hell. So salvation is not something that man earns. It's not something that he deserves. It's something that God gives him. Um, I think I have gone on quite long enough. And um, I was hoping to do all five points in this, uh, in this video, but uh, I think I will shorten this video just to do the, um, the uh, total depravity. So um, that's the whole of it. Um, original sin causes all men since Adam and Eve to have a sinful nature in them. This sinful nature so corrupts the soul that man is desperately wicked, that he desires only to do evil continually. All right? There is nothing that man can do that is good, that will recommend him to God. Isaiah says, all our filthy works are, uh, all our good works are filthy in the sight of God. And that filthiness that is translated in the King James Version is um, the woman's rag. So when you think that, oh, I've chosen you, God, I have done a work that has recommended me to you, that has given me the faith and the grace, etc., so that I'd be saved, you're, 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 you're waving your filthy rags in the face of God, and it's repugnant to Him. This is not uh, the, the doctrine of, quote, free will. It's not really free will. Because despite what Dr. Uh, Pastor Anderson wants to say, Calvinists believe in a free will. Right? You freely have a choice. Heaven or hell, uh, chocolate, pistachio. You choose wherever it is that you want to go when you are trying to find a seat. You have the free choice. The free choice is there in front of you. But that free choice is conditioned by your desires. And as I have tried to show here, because of original sin, even at conception, God considers you a sinner. And that, I think, proves that abortion is wrong because you can't impute uh, sin to a non-person. Right? Now, I'm not going to try to answer the question concerning babies. All right? um, God can change a person's heart even in the womb. He does it, he tells that to Jeremiah. Um, it's pretty evident with John the Baptist. When, when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, John the Baptist leapt in the womb. So it's very evident that um, God can change the heart in the womb. Even at conception, God can change that heart. Right? But, uh, you know, so that's up to God's point. That's up to God's thing. The, the thing that we need to worry about is ourselves. Do you have the faith that saves? And if so, if you think that that faith is what caused you to be saved, then you are thinking wrong. You are thinking unbiblically. That faith comes as a working of the Spirit of God. It is a gift of God. It comes by hearing the Word of God. And it comes by a direct act of the Spirit entering into your heart and making you born anew. As Jesus says, the Spirit, or the wind, blows where it wills. No man hears the sound or can cause the wind to blow into him, but it blows where it wills. And Jesus is likening the wind here to the Spirit of God, to making you born again. That whole section concerning born again is a section that is Calvinistic in nature. It comes by the working of the Spirit of God. It doesn't come by your work. You can't do anything that will cause the Spirit of God to enter into you. If the Spirit of God has entered into you, that's when you have faith in Him. It comes after faith and willingness to believe and follow after Jesus is, uh, is a fruit of the grace of God in your heart. And uh, I think I have said just about all that I can say. And um, I hope that this verse, this, this, this video will go out to you. And I guess I will have to do some more videos based on the five points. But this one point is very important. If it is God who regenerates you and makes you born again, then it is not by your faith. It's the faith that God gives you that causes you to be saved. It's the grace that comes first into the heart that gives you the faith 
that you believe in Jesus. And it is that grace that makes you willing. So whosoever will works perfectly within the Calvinistic uh, perspective because it's only those who will who are the ones whom God has chosen and given the faith and the willingness to do God's will. And um, I will end this with Philippians 2.13. May God bless you and keep you, and especially you, Pastor Anderson. Um, I hope and I pray that, these, uh, that this has been helpful and uh, that, you, that the truth now is evidently set forth before you. Praise God. Give Him the glory. And I will see you in heaven. God bless you. And this video is for Christ and Christ alone. Amen.